I'm Charlie Goodman, the interim pastor here at Higher Ground Baptist Church. I first want to thank you for taking the time to view this program. We recognize that for some of you that are providentially hindered, you probably view the Higher Ground Baptist Church as your home church. As a result of that, I want to invite you uh, to participate in an act of worship by giving. You can go to higherground.org and you can find a link there if you would like to give to the ministry of Higher Ground. And for those of you that uh, are able to gather in a local body, by no means do we want to take the place of that local fellowship. And if you're in the Tri-Cities area, we'd love to have you at Higher Ground Baptist Church. If you'd like to contribute to the ministry that makes broadcasts like this possible, we invite you as well to go to higherground.org and you can find a link there to give. Again, thank you so much for taking the time to view this program. And if you would be so mindful, you might consider just sending a note of appreciation or a note to let us know who you are and that you watch. That would be a great encouragement to the ministry and staff, especially those that make this program possible. Thank you so much again. May you have a blessed day and enjoy this service of the Higher Ground Baptist Church.
song. Stand up and sing it with us. Jerusalem, stand and sing with us. Here we go.
Amen. Amen. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. And I tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Just when I ran out of rum, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. He picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior. Jesus, thank you, Lord. I cannot deny what I've seen. Got no choice but to believe. My doubts are burning full like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends. Burning and bitterness. You know, church, the Bible says that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? Then let's worship him today. Let's get up out of that grave of sin and rejoice. Sing this next part with us.
faced a mountain that I've never faced before that's why I'm calling on you Lord I know it's been a while but Lord please hear my prayer I need you now I've never had before Ooh. Sometimes it takes a mountain Sometimes a troubled sea Sometimes it takes a desert To get a hold Your love is so much stronger than whatever troubles me. Sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe. Forgive me, Jesus, I thought I could control Whatever life could throw my way But this, I will admit, has brought me to my knees I need you, Lord, and I'm not ashamed to say no Sometimes it takes a mountain, oh Lord, sometimes a troubled sea, sometimes it takes a desert, oh yes it does, to get a hold of me, your love so much stronger than whatever troubles me. Sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and Sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe. Sometimes it takes a mountain, oh, sometimes a trust. To trust you and believe.
Sometimes it takes a desert, oh yes it does, to get a hold of me. Your love is so much stronger than whatever troubles me. Sometimes To trust you and believe. Sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe. So good to see you this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want you to find with me the book of James. The book of James in the New Testament. What a marvelous time of worship we have had to this point. Let me say thank you um, to the choir and to the orchestra and Brother Barry. Uh, what a marvelous job this day. And, and most of all, we're thankful for Jesus that uh, he gives us the opportunity. Today's an opportunity for us to, to worship him and uh, to draw ever closer to him. I'm thankful for settings like this, for settings where we can gather together, where we can worship corporately, where we can sing songs of praise, we can lift our praises up, where we can make our petitions known, and where God can speak to us out of his word. So I just want you to know today, uh, and I hope, I hope want you to know, I never take these opportunities for granted, and I hope you do not either. James chapter 1, James chapter 1 this morning, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 22, and the Lord's impressed on my heart the subject, living the Word. Living the Word. Now it's interesting because the Word is living, right? We, we have a, a, a written, living Word, and we find that Jesus is the He's the living Logos. And we find that this written word, which is alive, sharper than any two-edged sword, the Scripture says, this is the tool that God uses to bring us to himself. And we find that the written word, uh, this living written word, takes us to the living word that we find in Jesus himself. But how do we live out the word? How do we do that? If you're able to do so, stand with me out of the honor of the reading of God's word. James chapter 1 and verse number 22 is where we will begin this morning. James chapter 1 and verse number 22. Before we read that, church, can you say amen? amen. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And glory. glory. Amen. That makes me feel better. I hope it does you as well. The Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse number 22... But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth away, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Let us pray together this morning. Father, we love you, we praise you, and Lord, we ask you that we would not be merely hearers of your word. Father, we pray that we would not only receive, but Lord, that we would also respond. Father, that we would, we would not be consumed with doing, but consumed with being. And Father, I ask you this day that you would anoint my mind. I pray you'd loose my tongue. I ask you for clarity, both in thought and clarity in speech. And Father, I pray that you enable me to communicate your truth this day. 
And Lord, I ask you for anointing, the anointing that makes the preaching of your word easy. Father, I pray for the attention span of this congregation for just a little while. And Lord, I pray that you would be glorified through all things. I ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. You know, it's easy to misunderstand, isn't it? I mean, but it's amazing how that a minute misunderstanding or a minute mistake can lead to uh, quite significant consequences. You see, we find that God has called us to not only receive His Word, as the book of James is going to remind us of in the 21st verse. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, as he does leading up through chapter 1, he reminds us we have to receive the word. But then in verse 22, he reminds us that it's not enough just to be a hearer, but we're also called to be a doer. And I think sometimes we make a mistake in that. We, we mistake that, that God has called us not only to hear, not only to be present, but to participate. Did you know that you can be present in a service like this, but not participate? You see, worship is an act of participation. We do not come and gather as a body uh, to see a show or to hear someone sing or to hear someone speak, but we gather to worship holy God who spoke the world into existence, who changes lives, he who is, who was, and who is to come. But we find that here the Lord's half-brother, I believe to be the author of this letter, is going to write this letter as a general epistle to all believers at large. And he's going to do so probably somewhere, in my opinion, between the mid-80-40s and the late-80-40s. And in writing this general epistle, we find that James is going to challenge us. He's going to challenge us that our life should back up what we believe. As a matter of fact, maybe you've heard this saying. It's been said that your talk talks, but your walk talks more than your talk talks. Have you ever heard that? Well, James is reminding us that our walk talks. And as we are walking, in reality, we are talking, we are communicating. If what we believe really impacts what we do and who we are. And by the way, I'm persuaded that that is the goal of good theology, that we get to a place that we live out what we believe. We come here and we find ourselves in James chapter 1 and verse number 22. And James is going to challenge us not to make the grave mistake of being merely hearers and not doers. He's going to warn us not to become those who merely uh, take in intellectual truth and, and mistake that for spiritual understanding. He's going to remind us that we are on a journey. And by the way, being a believer and being a follower of God is not checking a box. It's not about walking an aisle when you were 9 or 10 or 12 or signing a card in vacation Bible school. It's not about merely being dunked in some water. It's about being born again. And the change that's transpired in the soul of the believer should have its impact as we go through life. Now let me illustrate. Let me illustrate from this morning. We, we saw the pictures of some devastation in and around Jenkins, Jenkins, Kentucky. You know that, that uh, a number of folks from Higher Ground Baptist Church went over there. Well, you see, that's putting your faith in action. We find that, that we, can, we can do that by going, we can do that by giving, we can do that by praying. But oftentimes what we do when we hear about tragedy, when we hear about a need that we could meet, when we hear about an opportunity to put our faith to work, we say, boy, I sure hate that happen. I hope someone will do something there. But you know, when, when God pricks our heart, he's often calling us to do that very thing. So this morning, how do we live the word? How do we come to a place that, that we, can, we can live the living word or get to a place where we are literally living out the word? Notice three things quickly this morning. Number one, living the word requires action. Did you know that? Living the word requires action. We seem to be in a day that uh, is strange, a, a day in which inaction seems to be approved more than action. 
It seems that we live in a day that, that no one ever shares the truth or, or shares their opinion on a subject if it's contrary to the blowing winds of the current culture. We live in a day that even the church capitulates to uh, the blowing winds of a, of a lost and a wayward and a perverse culture. But James calls us to action. He calls us not to sit on the sidelines, but he calls us to be involved in, in that which he is doing. Many of you have experienced the great study. And by the way, if you haven't, you should. The study experiencing God. And in that study that Dr. Blackaby gives us, in essence, here's the crux of it. He teaches us that God is always working and that God is always moving. And he teaches us that we should discern where is God working? What is God doing? and then we join him there. If you think about it, we're exactly backwards most of the time in our philosophy. Most of the time we make our plans. We say, here's what we're going to do. Here's where we're going to go. And then we pray, okay, Lord, will you bless this? Will you get on board with me? Understand this morning that God has called us to get on board with him. Understand that he is the one that sends. He's the one that calls. He's the one that saves. And he's the one that must receive all glory. But notice in this text, living the word requires action. Notice he says, but be ye doers. Do you see that? But be ye doers. Now, this, this but shows us that there's a connectivity from what he said already. And James has reminded us that we have to receive the word. But what do we do after we receive it? I remember a number of years ago, four or five, um, I was coming out of revival and I was coming out of revival at a place that I preached revival at for about 10 or 12 years in, in a row. And uh, this, uh, this person asked me, they said, they, they really like preaching down there, don't they? I said, yeah, they, they do. They, they really like preaching. And this was one of those moments, you ever had that moment where you open your mouth and you insert your foot? I mean, where you should have just stopped right there, but you didn't. And now I'm going to share it for the world. But uh, here's what I said. I said, they really like preaching, but they're not going to do much with it. You understand what, what I'm saying? I, I'm telling you that I could go there and preach and not be a dry thread on me. They'd hoop, holler, and shout and turn that place upside down. But I promise you that next year when I went, they wouldn't be any more than they were the year before. The next year that I went, there wouldn't be any more ministry than there was the year before. The next year that, that I went, that there wouldn't be any more souls saved than there were the year before. Do you hear me this morning? You see, worshiping a living Lord is not just about an experience. It's about a relationship. And James calls us here to be doers. Now, if you notice here, uh, genomai is going to be the, the word for be. Uh, it's the word where we get, it's the Greek word where we get our word uh, uh, genealogy. It literally means to be, to be born out of or, or to come out of or for something to transpire. And in the Greek here, we find that it's a middle imperative. So what he's saying is we should continually be doing this. Uh, he's not talking about us checking a box or us uh, uh, merely meeting a requirement, but he says we should be continually doing, continually becoming. Uh, notice that here, doing equals being. Uh, why do we do what we do? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I mean, why do we do what we do? I believe that the saints of God gather together in corporate worship. I believe when that happens that the church of the living Lord can have an impact on their community, an impact on a lost and dying world. And when that happens, not only will souls be saved, but saints will be edified. Saints will be revived. We find that those that are heartbroken will be mended up. It's the work of the church. But James calls us here first to be continually becoming, to continually be. Do you see it? There's, there's action there. But notice he says doers. Be ye doers, he said. Polyatrace is the, the, the Greek word. It, it literally communicates the idea that we do it with everything within us. It's not hard to notice if someone's doing whatever they're doing to the fullest extent of their capabilities, is it? 
I mean, it's easy just to watch. Maybe some of you sports fans will go back in time with me and you'll remember a day that Allen Iverson sat before some reporters. And there had been some complaints that, that he wasn't practicing really hard. And they questioned that. Y'all remember what I'm talking about? You know, he, he said, practice? Are, are, we, are we really here talking about practice? Are, are we talking about practice here? And yes, yes, that was exactly what they were talking about. They were talking about practice. He was dogging it in practice, and the fear was is you would dog it on game day. And, and maybe for Iverson, who was probably uh, in the top 1% of athletes, I don't know, that's just my guess, maybe he could do that. But friend, for most of us, our worship will be connected to our work. And our work will be connected to our relationship. Do you understand what I'm saying to you, church? We, we often find ourselves in a place where we think a little dab of Jesus will do us, a little dab of church will do us. I just want to check the box. As a matter of fact, do you know that, that almost 40% of folks who are between the ages of 18 and 26 who claim to be believers. Did you hear me? Almost 40% of folks between the ages of 18 and 26 do not attend any religious services regularly. That they determine that, they determine that, that phrase regularly. We, we used to, to say that was the case if you attended once a week, or before that it was twice a week, and, and now we're down to two times a month. But in order to get that statistic, uh, the, uh, the medium that they used was once a month. 40%. 40% of folks who say, yes, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I'll walk with him. Between 18 and 26, they do not attend a worship service anywhere. Why do you do what you do? Why are we here this morning? Uh, how come? How come we have gathered in this place? Well, if we were to ask James, he would say the right reason is because we are being. We are doing, and we are continually being shaped into who God has called us to be. We believe that the Word is living. We believe that Jesus is returning. We believe that there's power in His name. We believe the Word that says that we should gather together and that, that we, we should do that uh, even in face of tribulation and even in face of persecution. We believe the Word. We are doing and we are becoming. Now, maybe you're not understanding what I'm communicating this morning, but if we gather just merely to do without the intent to become, we're making a mistake. It, it may be a, a, a minute misevaluation, but it'll lead us to a place that will have grave consequences. Notice what he says here, but be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only. The word there for hearers, I really like it in the Greek language. It is the Greek word akroatres. Akroatres. It, it literally means to be a passive listener. The reason that I like that is because in my classes, I have some folks that are just passive listeners. Any of you ever audited a class? I remember being in a particular class and final exam day come and the professor said, listen, this is a tough test. I want to I let you know ahead of time. He said, a matter of fact, it's so tough, we're going to have a three-hour block for you to complete this test. I went in. He handed all of us a, a test packet. If I'm lying, I'm dying. It was 17 pages long. I started about 15 minutes into it. Another gentleman who had been in the class with me, he got up had his papers, took it to the desk, and turned it in. And I thought, you just failed. I mean, I remember thinking that vividly. Man, you just failed. A few days later, I asked him, I said, you know, uh, you bombed that test, didn't you? You bombed that final exam. You'll be taking that class again. He said, oh, no. Oh, no. I was just auditing. He said, I was just auditing, and I asked him if I could just come in and look at the test. He said, I just looked it over. It took me 15 minutes to read it, and then I just handed it back in. I was just auditing. Friend, we're not auditing. Do you understand that there is a day coming at the Bema seat of Christ that we will give account before holy God? 
Do you understand that, that there is a time coming when this life folds over, this life is done, the, the box is closed, and, and we find that there's a day coming that we stand before holy God, and we're going to give an account before him. No one is auditing the course of life, and James reminds us we cannot afford to be passive listeners. He says these folks are hearers. They are hearing, but they're not listening. They are listening, but they're not acting. They are, they're, they're just merely there to let the information go through one ear and out the other. There's been a lot of concern over the decline in the Baptist churches through the years. Do you know where most Baptists gather this morning? This morning, like most Sunday mornings, most Baptists gather resting upon Pastor Pillow at Bedside Baptist. Isn't that true? But there's a day coming that the course of life is going to be over. There's a day coming that the final exam is going to come and we're going to stand before a holy God. And we find that James reminds us here, be ye not doers, or, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. The word they're deceiving, it literally communicates to make a miscalculation. That's why this is so important. It's so important because a myriad of folks who, who gather week after week on church pews, they've made a grave miscalculation. You see, oftentimes when you ask someone, are you born again? Do you know Jesus? Uh, when you do that, the response is, yeah, I go to church down so-and-so. That's not the question. That's not, not what I ask you. I ask you if you know Jesus. I ask you if you've been born again. Now, a byproduct of that will probably be you're active in a local body. But it starts by being born again. And James is challenging us. He's challenging us that our walk must coincide with our talk. And our talk must be proved out in our walk. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. It's a mis calculation you ever made a miscalculation just try it this year on your income tax and and see how well that goes for you I remember one year particularly Ron and I got a letter from the IRS and they claimed that I owed them like a hundred and sixty something dollars because I had miscalculated I remember vividly she looked at me she said what are you gonna do I said I'm gonna pay it I'm gonna pay it that, that's what I'm gonna do I'm just going to pay that. I made a miscalculation. I'm thankful it wasn't any greater than that. But many of us make a miscalculation. We deceive our own selves. For many of us, the easiest to deceive is going to be ourselves. We can, we can trick ourselves. We can fool ourselves. Everything is okay. Nothing to see here, folks. But living the Word requires action. Not a action, not an action, but it requires action. Action, perpetual, because we want to be growing individuals who walk with the Lord. Many of us treat our church life, we treat our spiritual life much like we did in days gone by when we played cowboys and robbers, when we played house maybe. Maybe you had one of those little toy kitchens and you pretend like that you cook and you clean and all those things. We play at it. One pastor observed that it seems that we work at those things we should play at and we play at those things we should work at and worship is definitely something that we should be actively pursuing. Living the Word requires action. James chapter 4 and verse 17 said it this way, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Did, did you catch that? Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is what? Sin. I had this conversation just a few weeks ago with an individual, and if I'm lying, I'm dying. Here's what they said. They said, you know, I know, I should, I know this is right. I, I know this is right, but I'm going to do this. I took them to James 4, 17, and they were upset with me. Don't be upset with me. I didn't write it. Don't be upset with me. It's not my word. It's his word. But, but God says when we know to do right and we don't do it, then what is that? That becomes sin unto us. John chapter 13 and verse 17, we read this. If you know these things, 
Are you with me? If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you do them. God has called us to be a, a doing, to be a going, to be a, a giving, to be a praying, to be a, a, a group that is active. I've said many times you cannot spell God or gospel without the word go. God's called us to go. Now, not just stay. Now, we have to stay. There's times that we sit at the master's feet. Amen? And there, there's times that he pours into us, and we're thankful for those times of renewing, those times of refreshing. But what we need in our world is folks who will go for the gospel and go armed with the gospel to take it into a lost and dying world. Notice, living the word requires action. But secondly... Living the Word requires acknowledgement. Look in verse 23. He tells us, For if any be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face. Now the word here, beholding or, or looking, it literally means to glance. And oh, by the way, if you're wondering, the, the man there, it's clearly masculine. He's talking about a man. I have my own reason why. Have you ever seen a lady just glance in the mirror? I mean, think about it, man. How, how many mirrors do you need at your house? Hmm? We have big ones, right? Big ones. I don't know how, how it is uh, for you, but it doesn't take me long. I don't, I don't have to look to see uh, if my hair, you know, it's, it's quick. I, I, I don't need hair products. I don't really even need a comb. All I do is feel. See, do I need to cut it again? But bless your hearts, ladies. I mean, y'all even have those big mirrors, those magnifying with the light. That terrifies me. I looked in one one time. I do not want to see myself like that. <laughs> but men, let me tell you why you only glance in the mirror. Because if you really looked, you'd scare yourself to death. Amen? Hmm. But notice he says here, he says that if we're merely a hearer, we're like a man that, that glanced at his face. He, he glances at what he looks at. But then he goeth away and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. He, he, he looks, he glances, but he forgets. I'll get in trouble this morning, I'm sure, but I have seen a few folks. I wondered, have you, did you look in the mirror this morning? <laughs> Haven't you? Well, uh, James says here, they, they just glance. They just glance going by. And even when they just glanced going by, they forgot it as soon as they walked away. This week I was trying to illustrate in a, in a class setting, I was trying to illustrate about sharing truth in love. And I had a student, I said, okay, his name's Jeremy. I said, Jeremy, tell me I'm bald. And he just, come on, Jeremy, tell me I'm bald. And he's, he's thinking, no tricks, Jeremy, come on, man, you're killing me. Just, just tell me I'm bald. And he said, you're bald. And he said it about like that too, not, yeah, you're bald. I mean, he said, you bald, absolutely. Didn't offend me. Would have offended you. Well, it shouldn't because A, I asked for it, but, but B, it's true. It's true. You know, sometimes we forget that. I've shared this story with a couple of you privately, but this is true. A number of years ago, I, I don't know, probably 15 or so, I was preaching revival in western Kentucky, and Rhonda got to travel with me. She didn't get to do that a whole lot, and we were in a, a hotel there, and I got up the first morning after the meeting, went into the bathroom, and this particular hotel had a mirror in front of me and a mirror behind me. And I looked, and I said, Rhonda! Just like that. She comes bursting in. What's wrong? What's wrong? I said, did you know this? She's like, yeah. Yeah. I didn't know. Laugh at me if you want to. I didn't know. I mean, my, my day changed. My, my life changed that moment. I mean, I knew I was getting thin here. I didn't know it was completely gone here. James says... He says, one who is just a hearer of the word. 
They've glanced in the mirror. Again, now catch this. The Word of God becomes a mirror. The Word of God shows us not only who we are and where we are, but it also reveals to us who Jesus is. And he says that the one that, that hear, just hears the Word, they're not a doer of the Word, they're not active, it just goes through one ear and out the other, and then all of a sudden, uh, when they take a few steps, they've forgotten what they look like. What's your acknowledgement this morning? You say, Preacher, what, what are you driving at? Well, why are we here? Do we understand who we are? Do we understand where we are? Do we understand where we're going? Do we understand who we're going for? Do we understand those things? It requires an acknowledgement. And there's times that if you and I are going to move from hearers of the Word to doers of the Word, there must be an, an acknowledgement of what we see in the mirror of Scripture. We live in a day that, that, that folks uh, seem to be communicating that you can be right with Jesus and be wrong, and uh, biblically wrong, in every other category. The Bible doesn't teach that. Listen, if the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. Are you with me? If the Bible says it's right, it's right. If the Bible says it's good, it's good. If the Bible says it's bad, it's bad. But we live in a day where the words of Isaiah is true. They put good for evil and evil for good. Folks are communicating that which is bitter, and they're calling it sweet. And folks are calling that which is sweet, they're calling it bitter. And folks are calling that which is good evil, and they're calling that which is evil good. And James reminds us we have to acknowledge. We have to acknowledge that there's truth that there's truth that we can build our life upon, that there's truth that can take us from this life to the life to come, that there's truth in Jesus. Jesus.